and welcome to the new property show. I'm Steve McManaman. On this show, we have Emma who will be discussing with us architecture and design. More with Gary Brown on wealth creation, Pasha, how to access your credit report and how to get it right. We will hear from our panel, but first, Rory has ideas on putting a plan in place. So over the last couple of episodes, we've spoken about getting a goal, we've spoken about creating a budget, now it's about putting a plan in place to, to reach that goal. We know what the goal is, we know how much money we can get out of your budget to throw towards it, so now how are we going to actually achieve this goal um, by, and let's set that plan in place to get there. So there's some very different ways of doing this and a lot of the experts have different ways of, of showing you how to achieve those goals. And the one plan that works is absolutely the one you're gonna to stick to. So I really think you should try a few different ways, a few different plans to get there um, until you find what works for you. Not every plan from every expert is gonna be right for you. But certainly one that's very popular is putting your money into buckets. So having a, uh, a savings account, having a spending account, uh, having a, a shorter term savings account, maybe having an emergency fund, but making sure that your money is hitting your financial ecosystem and then going through into different funds of money so that you know where, you can, where you're gonna spend your money out of. It's very, very tempting if you've got one bucket of, of money, so your pay goes into it and then everything gets spent out of it. It's very easy to spend everything in that account until it gets topped up next month when your pay comes in again. So if you divert some of that money off, it's a really important way, a really great way of getting you to save more money. Another plan is when you have a, a, when you have a range of debts and you've got to choose which debt you're going to get rid of first. What we always say is pick one, focus on it, get rid of that debt before you try to tackle the others. It can be very tempting to try and pay off, if you've got multiple debts, to try and pay them all off at the same time. Whereas it's probably better get yourself a quick win, pay off one of your debts, and then focus on the next debt. But just make sure that you've got a plan in place. Make sure that you're not just shooting from the hip. You have a plan, you know exactly what you're going to hit, you're gonna know exactly what you wanna do first, and then attack it. But as I said, that's, there's, there's lots of plans out there. There's lots of ways that you can find yourself in a better financial position. Once you've got the goal and the budget, then you can choose the plan to make sure that you've got the plan that's gonna suit you for your personal circumstances. Emma, welcome to the new property show. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> Very exciting to have a architect. Uh, how did that come to be? Um, I always loved drawing when I was growing up. It was just something that I'd sit out in the garden when my parents were doing all their gardening and, and draw and mum works at Bunnings so she'd bring <laughs> home these little off cuts of timber and I'd be doing little DIYs and then yeah once we, we moved and they were suddenly building a new house um, I just was at that age where I was absolutely obsessed with drawing and visualising and thinking and that kind of became my new drawing thing so I um, was starting sort of like my first year of uni and I thought I don't want an ordinary job, I want to work in my industry and sort of get a taste for it now in case I don't like it and I just kind of knocked on a little door of a firm with some pencil drawings and said what about it so I ended up getting the job and kind of went from there. So what happened day one, you turned up, they've, they've put you on a wage or what was yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so there was myself um, as a uni student and then there was another guy, a uh, student doing TAFE. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of the two pathways, I guess, if you want to do drafting or architecture. And unfortunately for me, you need a bit of paper. So that involved five years of uni. It's a, well, I think it's six now, but it was the four year bachelor's and a, a one year master's. And um, I worked part time throughout the whole thing because you can kind of juggle that with your degree. What sort of projects were you working on? So obviously with architecture, there's everything from commercial buildings to residential. Mm -hmm. uh, what were you covering? Um, it's very broad and it's kind of like that. I always said my dream role would be an all rounder and mm -hmm. you kind of fall into that by default because when you work in those medium size or even large practices, like anything can come across the desk. So it might be a really beautiful high end home. And then the following week you're doing, you know, multi-residential apartments. You might get access to really big towers. And then all of a sudden you're doing like a shopping center or a retail fit out and I've done some hotels and things as well. So um, even offices, like yeah. during um, lockdown, I was working on a lot of office projects because they were kind of more government funded. So the ball kept rolling on those. And 
um, yeah, you kind of find there's not something I haven't really done. Um, I've even done like, you know, military and hospitals and just everything. You're yeah. saying too, like Offset earlier, that um, you've also done reviews because with the new home industry, typically mm -hmm. a lot of people would walk in with a design kind of preset. Yep. Um, at what point can you help them out and what are some of the tweaks that you'd normally do to a floor plan? So in terms of like the volume so builders where volume, you might yeah, have a pre-done plan? Um, where somebody may not necessarily have gone to an architect first, they've mm -hmm. gone and got a few ideas, they've brought them to you and I used to cut and paste a lot and stick them together. Yeah. Um, can you sort of piece the puzzles, um, piece the, the puzzle together from there? Absolutely, yeah. I think there's certain kind of, I, I don't want to say trends, but there are things that people mm -hmm. just kind of are interested in including in their home now. So um, a butler's pantry is a really good example of one that I'm seeing come up a lot because people really enjoy having that secondary space where you can kind of hide the mess. Maybe it's got a door, mm -hmm. you've got um, a larger pantry, and that's something that may not often be on some of those plans if they're a little bit of a um, legacy sort of thing mm. or someone just kind of hasn't thought about it. And those are the things that I can do a quick tweak on. Um, another one might be a really generous wardrobe space that has a little bit more customised joinery to sort of suit mm -hmm. the client in a bit more of maybe like a his and hers sort of wardrobe or just something a little bit more aspirational and, and unique that's um, not going to change the bones of the house too much, but it's just a really interesting inclusion. So it's nice to know that customers can actually come and see you sort of any stage. But if they wanted to see you, for example, they were doing a knockdown rebuild and we're talking about Bayside earlier, maybe down towards that Mornington Peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, what do they normally need to come armed with uh, in terms of obviously going to need a house or a knockdown rebuild? Yep. Uh, what do your clients, what's their brief need to look like? Um, I think the briefing process is definitely where I'd like to spend the most time with people. And that's just purely because we're talking about verbal communication mm -hmm. or an image in someone's mind, and you've got to then translate it to drawings and a 3D thing and eventually a building. So it's kind of like every industry or every relationship in your life, you need to have really strong communication mm -hmm. and people have different styles. So I would say like meeting up with people a couple of times, whether it be on site, um, getting them to bring you like some Pinterest pictures to mm -hmm. put together and getting really specific about what it is that they want as an end result. Like if it's going to be an add-on, it's like, great, then we can try and look more at a budget or something and, and figuring out what is the house missing that you really need? Is it just a push for some extra mm -hmm. room because your family is growing? Or if it's a complete knockdown um, rebuild, then it's really exciting because you can meet them and then kind of get a holistic overview of how they might want to use the space. But then you can go to the site and sort of start to explain to someone that we're not kind of just talking about four walls. Mm. Like we've got the boundary fence and, and you've got the land and the neighbours and the aspect and your unique site has, um, you know, it's certain orientation and things to consider as well. So um, you can really... In terms of light and everything as well. So yeah, are you yeah. playing around with um, double brick or cladding? Uh, what are some of the external features you really like to play around with to finish off a house? Um, I really love the trend more towards a little bit of more solid, timeless design. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you've spent any time um, up in Brisbane recently, you're probably seeing a lot of Brisbane stuff is trending and they're kind of really enjoying the Melbourne designers because mm -hmm. we have sort of more sturdy buildings down here just due to the fact that like the weather is a little bit crazy in winter. and. That kind of thing is, um, it kind of gives you some really beautiful elements in the design. So you might have more solid pillars or some mm -hmm. of those archways and things are coming back. And I think that's really beautiful because even if it's a warmer climate, you can kind of create those breezeways and things outside that it sort of separates from a flat facade and it mm -hmm. starts really adding a bit more volume and visual interest. And, you know, when you say light, then the sunlight filters through differently and it starts to become a really sculptural, beautiful building um, without necessarily needing to cost a ton more. It's just about using the facade you would have already paid for in a more interesting way. I've seen with a, car, a few of the car enthusiasts also too, um, in terms of the, the typical garage now with a polished floor, Yeah. Uh, maybe some halo lighting going in there as well. Yeah. Have you done any designs there where I guess the garage sort of faces internally into, into the home itself where they might have a uh, petition of glass through there as well. I've actually seen a couple of designs like that. Very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you kind of see those quite a lot throughout the, I guess, more affluent areas. Like in mm -hmm. Turak, there's people that have got a car collection that they're mm -hmm. pretty proud of and they sort of want to have, um, it's usually in a basement space, right, mm -hmm. as well, because you're sort of heading down there for security reasons, but also just because it's going to, you can't, there's only so much you can mm -hmm. go up. So you've got to go down to make that extra room. But I have seen a really cool um, development that I worked on in the past. And 
and it did have that. It was a glass wall mm -hmm. into the cars in there. It had all of the beautiful, like, it was kind of like a really cool workshop to joinery space that was done up. The ceiling and everything had all those kind of lighting finishes, polished floors, and it had like a bar and a games room on the opposite side. So it kind of became like the modern man cave in a way, because instead of spending time in the shed, you're bringing the boys down and it had like a cinema, um, a bar and a games room and the garage kind of all Must feel intermingling. amazing to, I guess, bring that much joy to people's lives. So what I'd like to ask next is the complicated bit really typically, they, they've, they've done the design, mm -hmm. now you've got to work with engineers and builders. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so how does, that, how does that marry together? What's, um, what's more important? And how would you recommend a builder in, do you mean, 2023? Yeah. Um, I mean, I personally actually enjoy that problem solving side of things. Mm -hmm. Like that's been something um, that brings me a bit of joy in architecture because you've got to maintain the design intent and that's mm -hmm. kind of my key role. Like mm -hmm. I want to go on the journey with people and mm -hmm. I don't want to have a team where I'm sort of fighting them along the way. I want to work with people where we can educate each other about why something's maybe not possible, how I could fix my drawings or how they can kind of get on board and bring it to life. So it's sort of about finding the right consultants that are really interested in doing things that are new and and they're not kind of wanting to build a rectangle like they want to come with you and say I want to win some awards I want to do something really great and this is how we are doing services now you want people who are following the trends and kind of keeping up with the leading edge of things and that's sort of um, why I think networking is really great because mm -hmm. even just meeting up with someone for a coffee, you can kind of get a much better vibe for their energy and what they're kind of interested in bringing to the project. And um, then I just sort of build up a book of those people and I just think like these are the people I would recommend for that kind of project that's got a more interesting outcome and then these are the more process driven people who might be great for a more quick and dirty project where you just need experts who can get it done. I think very exciting. So it seems to me, as said, obviously I've worked in the volume sales industry. Mm -hmm. Typically the drafts, drafts people don't get out to site. You actually go out to site, you check out your projects and not only you're visually, you're drawing these things and bringing them to life, you're actually bringing in elements that probably can be, you can maybe have some room for design change as you're going through the process. So you may get through and then decide, look, this window doesn't work or this beam's not working or we could add in a little bit more there. Mm -hmm. um, have you had some examples there where you're sort of three quarters away through the project and then you've changed your mind on something and gone, okay, we need to revisit this? Um, I traditionally wouldn't change my mind because it's not yep. my money at the end of the day, but yep. the clients will often change their mind. And <laughs> that might be something where there's like a PC so sum you. allocated yeah. to something and they're like, right, we don't really know what we want for joinery, but we kind of want to test it and try it and see it. And um, so, yeah, in that case, you might get people coming back with a variation on something where they they want to take it in a little bit of a different direction, um, which is fine, you know, you, but you you sort of... I think when you have a great brief from the beginning, you don't really find you need to change things too much because the way that I work um, in you know, Revit and then taking stuff into Enscape mm -hmm. or another 3D program, you can actually see it pretty clearly for what you're gonna get. So I think having that, that extra aid of like proper 3D renders, even applying materials to make it a bit more realistic can give people sort of the, the closest to the real thing of um, getting to tweak stuff in the design phase instead of sort of winding up on site and going, oh, that's yep. a little bit close to that, you know. Well, I think the idea is in terms of the Pinterest and visualising it and obviously the 3D renders are going to be really good. Um, Emma, I just want to thank you so much for being on the show today and we look forward to having you back and, of course, showcasing some of your work. Yeah, no worries. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>
So the more money that gets distributed or allocated to an individual, the higher the tax rate's going to be. If you look up on the screen, you'll see the different tax rates for the individuals. And why this is important is because a company can only issue out a dividend to the shareholders. So what happens when a company issues out a dividend to a shareholder and that shareholder has to pay additional tax? We call that top up tax. So what that means is a company will pay taxes at 30%, but the individual may have a tax rate of 34.5% plus Medicare levy. And what would happen is you'd have to have top up tax on that income. So let's say we had a property and we purchased that property for 500,000. We held it for 18 months. We then sold the property. We had a net gain of $100,000. In that example, under a company, we'd be paying 30% tax. So $30,000 in tax. And at the end of the year, we do the tax returns and we may want to issue out a dividend to the shareholders. So let's say we did that. So we'd issue out a $70,000 franc dividend with a $30,000 franc in credit, which would mean that an individual would have $100,000 worth of gross dividends. If you're an average Australian earning $91,000 in taxable income, this would bump you all the way up to $191,000, which would result in an additional $8,500 of top up tax being payable. And therefore, if you think about that overall gain that you made on the property of $100,000, you'd have effective tax rate of 38.5% on that gain, which is completely different to if you had that investment property owned under an individual or trust. Because remember, under an individual or trust, we're able to get the 50% discount on the capital gain, which would result in a net tax payable of around 18% on the capital gain. So I want you to always be thinking about the different structures that you have in place to be able to buy a property because they do have different outcomes in tax. I'm Gary Brown. Keep learning and take control of your financial future. Asha, welcome yes. to the new property show. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Today we're going to talk about credit reports. Um, first of all, where do you start? How do you access a credit report and and what do you guys do? So to access a credit report, uh, there are something think called credit bureaus. So there are three credit bureaus in Australia, being Equifax, Ileon and Experian. You can access your credit report uh, from one of the three websites listed on screen right now. But you could also uh, contact us directly and we can obtain your uh, credit report for you. And what do you think a credit report, what's the use of a credit report? What does it actually help you ascertain? Interesting question. So I guess the, the short of it is a credit report is a good um, indicator about your financial health, um, similar to like a, a blood report would be from a doctor. So it gives someone who um, wants to lend you money or to assess if you're credit worthy to determine uh, if you are a good repayer or you've had good history uh, to make a determination on what type of products would be available for you from a finance point of view. What are you typically seeing on them? Is it, is it utilities? Is it loans? Um, what's actually picked up and what are, what are the current trends? So you have a variety of uh, items listed. So um, for example, your credit card, personal loans, mm -hmm. home loans, they'll be listed in including uh, how you're making your payments if on time or not, for example. Um, so that's called your repayment history information. Uh, then you have, for example, utility providers and telcos. Uh, so that information on your mobile phone plan um, would be also there recorded as well. So utilities being for gas and electricity. Um, and then you has your personal information as well. Uh, so you want to make sure that everything is correct and accurate as much as possible. Including change of address and that as well? Is that, does that pop up? Absolutely, yeah. So what happens a lot of the time is um, the address of the person doesn't match the, the person where they are. And then that leads to other potential uh, fraudulent or identity issues when the person wants to come and uh, seek finance. What are some of the most common things that seem to pop up on a credit report? Um, and then really, how do you go about repairing them? Okay, so um, what we see right now with regarding the trends, obviously with the cost of living going up, uh, repayment history information is being impacted. So people are prioritizing naturally their home loans over like their credit cards or personal loans. But what they're not realizing is when they're not making the repayments on time, it's having a significant impact on their credit worthiness and impacting their credit score overall. Uh, and the algorithm will then deem this person to be not credit worthy. So when they come to get finance, whether it's for personal loan, car loan or whatnot, that's when it comes impacts them. So uh, what we do as a practice, so um, being the principal of Australia's largest legal practice that specialises in credit repair, um, we do exactly that. So uh, we determine whether or not uh, 
adverse entries like defaults, judgments, uh, late repayment history, or if they've got too many inquiries uh, that they've done online, if these things can be removed to uh, rectify the client's credit report so they're in a position to get the best loan possible uh, via their finance representative. So I've heard the numbers um, on a credit report, love to sort of really tackle them, but zero to 500, 500 to 600, 600 mm. to 800. Uh, let's start with zero to 500. So what sure. does that sort of client look like? So um, zero to 500 is in the category of what's deemed by the credit bureaus as a poor credit score. Um, so maybe working through, through some examples with you. So um, there's, uh, we get clients that, for example, their credit score is low because of the repayment history information being impacted. Uh, then we analyze to see if that can be improved, removing the repayment history information or correcting it. Um, and then the score jumps up as a byproduct. Uh, between that 500 to 600 category, um, that's better but it's still probably not going to get you into that excellent category to be el eligible for the best lowest interest rates possible out there uh, when seeking finance. So as an example, um, sometimes we get clients that are trying to get car loans and their credit score is just um, just below where it needs to be. So it's good, but it's not excellent. Uh, so maybe they've had too many inquiries. So um, they've gone shopping online with payday lenders, which is a bit of a no-no when it comes to the uh, credit bureaus. Um, so we look at if those items can be removed by analysing with the client and the credit score goes up, then the client would be then eligible to get that car loan that they wanted to. Um, and then you've got uh, your ideal category, so excellent. I, anything probably uh, above uh, 700 and above, so it goes up to a scale of 0 to 1200. That's where you want to be, um, to be able to seek the best financial products available and to go for the best interest rates to stay away from um, non-conforming lenders, if you would. Okay, um, I actually, I didn't realise the number went all the way to 1,200. Mm. What's, a, what's a client look like that's over 1,000? Um, you mean that's pretty blessed? Uh, how, do you, how do you get a score like that? Uh, so th there's a few different things that you can do. Uh, with So you can um, check your credit reports regularly with alerts mm -hmm. to make sure that mm -hmm. things haven't been impacted and that also will help you to avoid uh, things that happen from a fraudulent point of view by being on top of it or keeping your finger on the pulse, if you will. Um, the other things you can do is, for example, making sure that you make repayments on your um, cards and home loans maybe two days before the due date. Mm -hmm. Now, what we found out is that actually has an impact with the algorithm um, for whatever reason. So there are a couple of things, but um, we have some more tips that uh, we'll be able to share with you. Don't do too many credit inquiries in a short span of time. Modify your spending habits set repayments on accounts to occur a few days ahead of the due date. Paying a debt will not remove the default or judgment from your credit report. It will simply update it to paid and still remain on your report for between five to seven years. So be sure to contact us before you pay it. Don't ignore the debts because defaults can be relisted. Identity fraud. So make sure you keep your credit reports and check on it regularly to avoid any identity issues. What about a client that has not obtained a loan before? They're 25 years of age. Sure. They've been taught the philosophy of cash, cash, cash. They don't. Ha they live with mum and dad. They actually don't have a loan. Would you suggest they actually sh should start building some sort of credit history? Should they go and take a small personal loan out or credit card? Because sometimes there being no such thing as always the perfect client. Sure. But they go to apply for a loan and they haven't. They haven't really ever had anything before. So. What would you suggest in that scenario? Uh, firstly, I'd be saying before you do anything, speak to your finance representative. They know mm -hmm. best to be able to indicate for you, um, I guess from a credit reporting point of mm -hmm. view, where, where, you're, where you're positioned. Mm -hmm. If your credit report is poor or low because you have adverse entries on there like defaults and uh, judgments because in a previous lifetime something's happened, um, then that's when we can also get involved to help rectify those items to make your credit score go up. So I think it's important to categorise that there's um, a difference between your credit score and credit worthiness. Mm -hmm. They are interrelated, but you've got, for example, uh, we've got clients that will come with an excellent credit score of 800, but because they've got a negative listing or an adverse entry on their credit report, that then doesn't fit a good lender's policy. So it's important to, to rectify those issues before you apply for finance. Last question. If somebody's got, um, let's say they had a few um, outstanding matters um, and the only real way forward for them was to consolidate debt, 
uh, would you recommend that practice and, and how would you go about that? So for example, um, before they can move on to purchasing their home, for example, they've got a few matters of 2,000, 4,000, 1,000. Uh, would you recommend consolidating, cleaning all that bad debt back up mm -hmm. and then moving forward? Uh, again, I would be saying speak to the finance representative to make sure what your strategy is so it doesn't mm -hmm. impact your uh, borrowing capacity because right now, obviously, with a higher interest rate, tighter lending policies, people can't borrow as much as they could uh, before COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so long story, I think it's wise to be able to minimise your debt as much as possible, but as important, if not more, make sure that those debts don't um, accumulate and into a spiral with bad spending habits to then um, make you, I guess, become defaulted. So Pasha, um, I'd like to know if you've got bad credit, what you should do next and, and why you guys? So first thing is for, don't apply for any more types of finance. First, we need to um, stem the bleeding, if you will. So um, first thing is to get in contact. If you've got a copy of the credit report, feel free to share it with us. If not, we can order it. The one that we order doesn't impact your credit score at all. Uh, it's a file access, so then we'll run a upfront analysis with you. And I guess that point points into one of one reason why us to answer your question. So they get to the client gets to speak to a solicitor uh, trained in credit repair and credit law to make sure there is grounds um, that we're able to assist. So you know we'll speak to you on the phone, find out what because each person's case is different, um, and it doesn't have to be something big. Uh, it doesn't have to be a huge life life event. It could be the smallest reason. So 99% of people pay their bills on time. There's always a reason why, why we don't. And you know, if we can look at that and then we can be able to open that up and tell you upfront whether or not we can assist. Um, so if we can, fantastic, we can talk about the process moving forward. But if we can't, then we'll try to steer you in the right way about what you can do for now. Beautiful, great tips. Look forward to having you back on the show and thank you for joining us today on the new property show. Thank you very much. And for all your uh, interested viewers out there, um, they can contact us via the information um, on screen or they can uh, reach out and uh, call us. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, panel. Welcome to uh, this week's episode of The New Property Show. We're discussing design. Uh, Favourite room of the house? Mine would have to be bathrooms. Mine would be the kitchen. Kerry's stolen it from me. Bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree with Robbie. Uh, from a builder's point of view, it's really fun working in a bathroom. Um, there's a lot of things that capture your eye as soon as you walk in. In particular, with the tile layouts, you want them to really align with your niches. You want to have your natural light in there so it could be a skylight. But it all needs to be positioned well. And as you know, Kerry, um, the colours that you choose in the bathroom, we've seen some, some real horrors there. The tiles just don't work or the colour palette doesn't work or they've Cut, cut off on the cabinetry a little bit and they haven't got the finish that they wanted but they've invested so much money and they're just not really getting the, the return on the investment of what they spend. So, yeah, it's, it's, it takes a lot of skill to get it right and when you get it right, it looks really good. Pretty challenging too when they bring out a shower, it's only a 900 by 900, you've got all that space yeah. and uh, you guys are quite tall. Um, how do you feel about that and what would you do to rectify it? That I would not design a, a shower like that anymore. I think that's kind of something that's a little bit of a legacy item that gets left mm -hmm. on plans these days. And I mean, if it was a house you were renovating, you might be dealing with something like that and you might have um, spatial constraints that would kind of limit you in what you're doing. But I would always say as much as possible, you want to have the open showers and Obviously, that they bring their own challenges. Like now we're finding a lot of people want to chuck a shower screen on it because you don't want to have that spill or the spray out and everything. But I definitely think having those beautiful, long, open showers is um, absolutely what you want just in terms of space and <laughs> feeling like you're not kind of banging your arms while you're in there. Yeah, and I also feel natural light. I think when people build their bathrooms, they forget about bringing in the natural light. And then when they're putting their fittings in there, you know, they don't put like backlit mirrors or anything like that. So it can get very, very dark. And I think it's really important to uh, educate people of, of um, you know, bringing a lot more light into the bathroom as well. I think you can also achieve that too via like large windows, like a fixed window. You yeah. still also need to have, um, I guess you guys got to build them, but aerated, um, but have as almost, almost one way glass that's actually sort of looking outside into maybe a feature garden as well. Uh, are they some of the functionalities or functions you're coming across nowadays? Yeah, well, 
One of the new ones that's come in is actually um, electric charge glass. So when you mm -hmm. flip the switch on, it frosts itself off. Um, again, depending on your town planning, whether or not mm -hmm. you can have it, have it obscured or not. Um, and yeah, budget, so, obviously. And, and budget, yeah. Pretty pricey. What are we doing, guys, with, with kitchens nowadays? So let's move on to, I guess, the kitchen layout. Um, is there island benches, are they still a thing? Are you doing the U-shapes? Uh, what's the perfect kitchen layout? Love to, love to hear. Yeah, um, I mean, stone and marble is just so in. So, mm -hmm. you know, having, having um, and picking and choosing beautiful stone is so important. And just, to, you know, with the waterfall edges as well, it looks so, so pretty. So I think that's very popular. Yeah. What about the cooktops in the centre um, nowadays? So, you I mean, a lot of people are hosting dinners and even getting chefs over. They're spending so much more time at home. Mm. Um, have you, are you starting to see people move the, the cooktops from the back traditional backsplash to their stair through to the centre there and actually having those designed? Definitely, especially if you've got the cooktops now with the downwards draft range hood, mm -hmm. they're starting to get quite popular. So you don't actually have to have anything above you. So you can nearly have skylights above your cooktop and still lose all your downwards draft straight into the... Uh, yeah, electronic cooktop. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I'd actually like to look at your take on it, Gills. What's your thoughts on having two sinks? Your sink and then your sink and your island bench top. I would kind of think you'd tend to have one hidden away. It's sort of like the butler's pantry situation. Mm. You might have that kind of um, area where you've got the extra, potentially the extra oven, an extra sink or something for washing up and kind of keep that all hidden away. But in terms of the main area, I think a lot of people sort of they want the island bench to be free of the sink. So often we would kind of place it on there and people go, no, I don't want that. They just want mm. it on the back. The island bench is kind of the main place where you might be sitting at and dining. And right. it's probably a little bit easier in terms of servicing as well, not needing to run plumbing and things to the island bench, but it's always usually powered, I find, but so you, not you necessarily. You did say you would place it there though. I, I, I personally, I've got one in my house and I love it. I love I don't it know as how well. anyone would operate without a sink. Yeah, it's middle. my preference as well. And particularly yeah. if you're, you know, getting things prepared, like um, in my parents' house when I designed theirs, I had um, the, the sink in the island bench because yeah. for me, it's like the kitchen is the heart of the home. And yeah. if you're entertaining or you're preparing food or even just chatting with your guests, your island bench is facing outwards. So yeah. you don't want to have your back turned to people. You want to be mm. engaging. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, yeah I agree. And, and, you know, therefore when you're standing, at it, it's kind of like that little showpiece workbench and you're sort of prepping things and chatting yep. away and and even facing out towards your beautiful backyard and your garden view. You want to be actually thinking about how am I using this space and unless you have a window in your um, splashback or something in the kitchen then you sort of actually want to reverse that activity and definitely have the, the sink in the island bench to I think me. the sink though typically is only going to be used if you are really rinsing as long as you're not piling up dishes. At the end of the day if you're entertaining, you want to make that house look okay, as clean as possible. What we did when we built our last house was have a just a small sink there, just for you know, peeling potatoes, entertaining, just washing, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then we had everything just out the back. So we just threw the dishwasher out the back and all the dishes out there. So you can just clean up, shut the door, mm. <laughs> put the dishwasher yeah. on and off you go. Declutter. Yeah, declutter. yeah I find yeah. Um, on trend at the moment is definitely like a second kitchen at the back. Mm -hmm. So really, what's facing at the front, obviously you've got your fridge and your stove, but everything else is out the back. And I think that's because people just want beautiful clean lines and their island bench is a feature, so they don't really want to put sinks in there now. So that's what I'm uh, experiencing with my clients at the moment. They just want everything really clean lines and just nothing sort of facing out the front. A lot of people are using them as their actual dining table as well. Yeah, If, yeah, if they've they got are. minimal mm -hmm. space, yeah. you do a bit of extra overhang so you can fit, you know, five yeah. or six chairs around it. Yeah. yeah. So I'm actually a bit more, I like having the sink at the back. So I'm more, because I obviously about the feature and the design of the, the marble and I find it such a piece and it's a wow factor in the home that I like just to have it just one block of a feature rather yeah. than have the sink there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about uh, master bedroom? So um, talking about those, like would you recommend having a master bedroom to the front of the home or are people moving it sort of back away now and they're having the office to the front? And then second question to that is, mm. how big's too big? <laughs> yeah. Um, what size should the master bedroom be? Well, the master bedroom is, um, you know, a parent's retreat. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, another room for them to actually relax in and go there while the kids <laughs> get away from the kids a little bit and have some downtime. So I sort of think you really need to put a lot of effort into your master bedroom now and even have, um, you know, a beautiful like sofa in there. People are really luxing up their master bedrooms now and utilising it just as another big room for them. Yeah, 
I've even found um, there's a couple of trends coming from the US and obviously they're a lot more generous with their mm. housing sizes and spaces and actually the terminology is being transferred across mm. as well. So they call it a primary suite and that kind of language is now being um, used on some of the more premium developments mm. that I was working on that were um, high-end sort of apartment buildings and things. and they're actually wanting a lot more amenity. And for it to really, when you say sweet, it kind of implies that you're spending a little bit more time in there. So you've got, yeah, a really luxurious area with yeah. definitely some more loose furniture in there for someone to sit, or um, maybe even the wardrobe has like a little beauty cabinet in there where someone might actually sit down and do their makeup instead of standing in the bathroom. So definitely, yeah. It's really like a high-end yeah. hotel. Mm -hmm. Yes, like exactly. It's a hotel yeah, suite. Exactly you, can, right. you can literally go and live there and yeah. shut off if you want That's to. That's right. Yeah. We've seen um, one of our favorite designs really was um, when I was selling back for volume builders, was a large master suite. Let's say it's five five meters by four. It's absolutely huge. Um, but then what we we're integrating in there was a small study uh, because not everybody's yeah. switching off. Um, they can sit pretty well, lock the house up, come and finish on their laptop, have a cup of coffee, whatever they need to do, write down their few notes. But integrating the master suite with a small study suite as well seemed to be another feature that people were playing with. Um, and then really for the ladies, what we're finding there is Typically, I don't personally like having a walk-in rope next to a next to a bathroom, um, really just for moisture and condensation. But what we were doing is we we're building the master, um, I guess, the walk-in rope behind the master uh, master bedroom as well. Really having quite a wide floor plan in terms of length. Um, in terms of a, I guess, a walk-in rope fit out. What's the ideal scenario there? How big should that be? And what would you have in it nowadays? Depends how many clothes you've got. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Over yeah. the ladies. I mean, you can get yeah. his and hers yeah. either side. I've yeah. yeah. like a 300 mil cupboard. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's me done. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, and last, I guess the last question is, um, would be light, okay? Um, I'm all for vaulting ceilings, um, putting them right to the top to the trusses. These builders here don't always like, can be a bit costly. Uh, pros and cons with that, but I think wherever you can, one of the best things you can do is take a ceiling height from really sort of 2.5 metres to 3 metres and really pull that out to 3.5 to 4 metres in height. Uh, would you be for that if that was in the design? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. 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 High ceilings are a feature. Yeah. So definitely um, it creates um, it creates such a bigger space and that, that illusion. So 100%. Especially for the smaller room. That yeah. makes it feel huge. When we done the block, the first thing we walked in, we said, yep, get rid mm -hmm. of all the ceiling joists, yep. lift the yeah. ceiling, put in a few skylights. What are some of the issues that sort of can come up with it, I guess, from a plumbing point of view or, mm. um, I guess, heat? Definitely uh, services. Yep. Yeah. 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 And yeah. So if you're trying to run ducted heating, you've obviously got restricted mm -hmm. um, space in the ceiling. Um, yeah, yeah, and the the overall energy rating of the house. Yes, Because there's more ceiling space. Bigger yep. area. Yep. One of the things we found was just cooling the place. Um, when you've got a ceiling that runs all the way to the top there, it's obviously, as you're talking about the ducting, but yep. really it's just trying to cool it. You can't really get a fan up there. It's yeah. just, the heat's just going all the way. It's just coming through all the way. It's good. So guys, uh, thank you so much. Really good, healthy debate today. Oh, thank um, you. Can't wait to have you guys again on the panel. Thanks, Otis. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>